Welcome back to the FPL video and podcast. This will be the predicted lineups for game week two. I got several spots on in the last edition, but to get every single one correct is going to be an impossible task, but it will give you an idea of the players that are nailed on for every single Premier League club and a few changes we could see from the game week one lineups to this week in game week two. Smash the like button and subscribe for new if you enjoy the content. Let's try to get this video to the 200 likes and let's keep on pushing towards 35 subscribers and beyond. We have reached a lot of milestones throughout the summer, so thank you very much for your support. On screen, you can see Draft Town, which is a great resource I've been using for over a year, and they've got their own version of the predicted lineups. And there will be some disagreements, so to speak, between my predictions and theirs. But generally speaking, I think we're on board with most selections. And as you can see with Arsenal, they've currently got an identical starting 11 from game week one. And the biggest issues would be in defensive midfield, possibly up front if Havertz moves into the midfield and then Jesus up front, but I don't think that'll be the case here. Martin Lee or Trossard on the left wing and Sinchenko versus Timber or Calafuri at left back, as I'll discuss very soon, because we'll kick things off with Arsenal and talk about every single Premier League club in Game Week 2. The next four fixtures look very tough for the Gunners, but in Game Week 2 specifically against Aston Villa away, I think Julian Timber will come in for Sinchenko to offer a bit more defensive solidity up against Leon Bailey and in the two games last season where Aston Villa got the victories against Arsenal, Sinchenko was the starting left back and Bailey got a goal and an assist across both matches. I also think Trossard will start over Martinelli but that's almost 50-50. I don't think Martinelli did enough in his start against Wolves and Trossard didn't do much off the bench but I think he has credit in the bank for what he has done since joining Arsenal back in January of 2023 and I also think think that in the end of last season and also in the preseason games recently, Trossard has got on the edge over Martinelli as the starting left winger for the Gunners and Thomas Partey should start in the midfield but don't be surprised to see Jorginho or maybe Declan Rice in that position and a bit of a change in the personnel but I firmly believe Kai Havertz will start up front and not play in the midfield for the next four game weeks. David Rao will be in goal with a back four of White, Saliba, Gabriel which is very nailed on. The left back spot is definitely not the same case and it's between Calafuri, Timber and Sinchenko but I think Timber coming on for the Ukrainian left back towards the end of the Wolves game was indicative of what we'll see in these tough away games right now. I don't think Calafuri will be thrown in the deep end to make his debut at Villa Park. The midfield will likely be Partey, Odegaard and Rice and it's really just that defensive midfield that I'm unsure about. Sack and Havertz will undoubtedly start and then Trossard on the left hand side is what I've gone with. Let me know your thoughts down the comment section below. The same goes for every other lineup but let's now move on to Aston Villa. Just hear me out because the right back spot might be wrong here. Now, the reason why I've gone for Conser shifted to right back is because Matty Cash picked up an injury against West Ham in that 2-1 victory for Aston Villa. And I could see Diego Carlos slotting in alongside Pau Torres and then Conser on the right hand side. But it was Costa, a young right back from Serbia who came on towards the end of that match. We could also see him start, but an 18 year old up against that Arsenal attack, it does seem like a very tough ask for him. So I think if Aston Villa want to be defensively solid and Matty Cash is unavailable they'll go for this back four with Dibo Martinez in goal fresh off that new contract signing until 2029 with the villains concert Diego Carlos, Pau Torres and Luca Dean but I must stress that if Matty Cash is available I think he'll start right back and we'll see concert alongside Pau Torres as the centre backs. The midfield will likely be Bailey, Anana, Tielemans and McGinn with Rogers and Ollie Watkins up front. I think that's fairly nailed on. The only position I'm unsure about is that right back slot and it all depends on Matty Cash's fitness. Gimmick 2 looks tough against Arsenal at home but then it's Leicester, Everton and Wolves until game week 5 with two back-to-back -back home games so that looks really promising for Aston Villa and they've got good fixtures until game week 8. In the end, Bournemouth turned out to be a very difficult team to predict for the opening game against Nottingham Forest, but Neto will start in goal. Now, they are looking for another goalkeeper, so watch this space, but so long as they don't do so, I think Neto will start in goal for the Cherries. A back four of Smith, Zabani, Senesi and Kirkes is likely, and then you've got Scott and Lewis Cook as the two holding midfielders, and I expect the front four of Semenyo, Tavernier, Sinistera, and new signing Ivan Olsen 
£40 million from Porto. I think he'll be the starting striker week in, week out. So unfortunately, the £4.5 million forward dream of Jebison does seem to have ended as he's the third choice striker now behind Semenyo and Ivanelson. Now with Semenyo, I don't expect him to start up front unless Ivanelson is taken off and maybe Bournemouth want to go for a counter-attacking system and go for another pacey winger or perhaps another option like Cloyver as an attacking midfielder or on the right-hand side, which pushes Semenyo further up front. The next four fixtures look very tough for the Cherries on paper against Newcastle, Everton, Chelsea and Liverpool. That's by far the toughest of the lot on paper. But you never know. Bournemouth can surprise people. They've still got some very impressive players in their ranks and there were some big upsets in their defensive line back in game week one with Sonesi missing out. But I would expect them to feature and start the game against Newcastle. Brentford did very well to beat Crystal Palace 2-1 in the opening game and I don't expect many changes if any at all so I've gone for the exact same starting 11 and this was one of the teams I got spot on by the way for the gimmick one predicted lineups across both versions. Flecken in goal, a back four of Ruslev, Collins, Pinnock and Aya and a midfield free of Norgard, Jensen, Janel, and that front free of Mbumo, Sharda and Wissa. They have a very tough task facing Liverpool away and it doesn't get much easier afterwards. You do have Southampton at home in gimmick free to be fair, but then Manchester City and Tottenham away back to back. That looks extremely tough for the Bees. Ivan Tony is on the verge of leaving the club and he's constantly linked with moves away. And you also have to look at Fabio Carvalho as a budget midfielder. He could break into this team eventually, but I don't expect that to be the case in gimmick two. Don't even get me started on Brighton. The biggest shock, I think, in terms of popular FPL assets was to see Valentin Barco on the bench and he's now very close to joining Sevilla on loan. Brighton want to give him a lot of game time and they probably aren't able to do that themselves this season. But after what he was doing in the recent friendlies, playing virtually every single game and impressing with some very good performances, we all thought Barco would be the standout formerly defender for at least the first four or five gimmicks of the season. But I hold my hands up. I was wrong. I still think Barco has a big future even at Brighton but this season isn't meant to be and it looks like he'll leave Brighton and that could lead to a price lock very soon but Jason Steele will be the starting goalkeeper until Verbruggen returns from his injury a back three of Veltman, Dunk and Van Heck but this is kind of a hybrid formation 4-2-3-1 and a 3-4-3 I've gone for Minter and Hinselwood as the two wing backs Wiffer and Milner as the two central midfielders and a front three of Matoma, Joao Pedro and Danny Welbeck but it wouldn't surprise me if Joao Pedro drops to the bench after Brighton's latest signing and Man United at home looks like a very good fixture but then it's Arsenal way afterwards though you do have Ipswich and Nottingham Forest at home back to back and I could see Brighton gain several points over the next four game weeks with Chelsea don't be surprised if they make multiple changes to the starting 11 every single week and that includes their back line, let alone their goalkeeper. They've got six to choose from and Robert Sanchez isn't safe after a shaky performance against Manchester City. But I believe he'll be in goal against Wolves in game week two and a back four of Gusto, Fafana, Colwell and Cucurella. The most likely to break into that defensive line is probably Badia Chile, but don't get me wrong, I think with these four centre-backs, you just don't know who's going to start every single week. I've gone for a midfield pivot of Enzo Fernandez and Lavia, who is one of the shining lights against Man City, his former club and I think a front four of Palmer, Nkuku, Pedro Neto and Jackson is likely for now but with the new signing of Joao Felix that could spell trouble for Nkuku later down the line and we could see a lot of rotation between a lot of the attackers with the exception of Cole Palmer who is by far the best option Chelsea have to offer and the best thing about the Blues is their fixtures until game week 8. You might be thinking where is Joachim Anderson? Well, according to recent reports, he is on the verge of joining Fulham and it hasn't been announced just yet. But very reliable sources like the New York Times have delved into this and it looks like a matter of time before Joachim Anderson rejoins Fulham and that's going to be a massive blow to Crystal Palace. And Mark Gay is still not safe and locked in for the starting eleven because he's heavily linked with Newcastle United. But assuming he stays at the club, Dean Henderson will be in goal and the back three of Chris Richards, Chaddy Riyad, the new signing, and Mark Gay, and also a midfield four technically of Munoz, Wharton, Hughes and Mitchell. But of course, Mitchell and Munoz would be the wing-backs in this system. Kamada, Eze and Mateta would be up front. So the only doubt I have is Mark Gay and with Joachim Anderson leaving the club, I think there could be a massive downgrade to their clean sheet prospects over the next four game weeks, despite some good fixtures like West Ham at home and Leicester. 
there are several teams that could switch to a back five this weekend and Everton are one of them with that very tough game on paper against Tottenham away. But I'm going for Pickford in goal and a back four of Seamus Coleman who will replace the suspended Ashley Young, Tarkovsky and new signing O'Brien who is highly rated from Lyon but we saw Michael Keane start back in game week one and maybe these two alongside Tarkovsky will form that back three should Everton switch to that formation. I've also gone for Mikalenko on the left hand side and a midfield four of Harrison, Idrissa Garnage, Eric Bonham and McNeil and a front two of the Corey and Calvert-Lewin who is also heavily linked with a move away and don't be surprised to see new signing in Dai starting as the second striker behind Dominic Calvert-Lewin should he stay with the Toffees. The next three fixtures look tough with Tottenham and Aston Villa away but Everton are still top of the fixture difficulty rating until Gemic 14. My biggest doubt about the Fulham starting eleven is at right back. It's between Tete and Castagna. Now it was the Dutchman who got the nod against Manchester United in the Premier League opener but I think Castagna could still start most games in the Premier League this season but I've gone for Leno, Tete, Diop, Bassi and Robinson but Joachim Anderson will break into that starting 11 very soon it could be as soon as game week three maybe even this weekend depending on how quickly they get the transfer done I've gone for a midfield pivot of Lukic and Andres Pereira and a front four of Adama Traore, Smith Rowe, Iwobi and Rodrigo Menis. The next three fixtures in particular look sensational from an FPL perspective, particularly for these budget midfielders like Andres Pereira and Smith Rowe. Ipswich Town were very competitive in the first half against Liverpool, but tailed off in the second and the quality ultimately prevailed. Now, Muric was injured for the first game and he's still a doubt for game week two, but if he is fit and fully available, I think he'll start over Walton, who played very well against the Reds. And I think they'll switch to a back three against Man City at the Etihad with Twanzebi, Wolfenden and Greaves, but Burgess could also start if they switch to this formation and it could be Twanzebi actually falling out of the starting 11. Now, I think the two wingbacks will be Johnson on the right-hand side and Davis will definitely start on the left, but what we could also see it's Swansebi as the right wingback and Burgess as one of the three central defenders. Now, I've also gone for Morsi and Luongo as the two central midfielders and a front three of Chaplin, who hasn't played on the right wing spot for several years now, but he can do a job there and he's actually got a decent record in that position. Hutchinson on the left and the lap up front. After Man City, it gets better for the newly promoted club with Fulham, Brighton and Southampton as the next three fixtures. I think we could see one or two changes to the Leicester City starting 11. It was a huge shock to see Mavadidi on the bench and Jimmy Vardy starting because it seems like he was going to be out for the first two game weeks at the very least, possibly even until game week four after the international break. But Hermansen will be in goal and he played fairly well against Tottenham Hotspur in that 1-1 draw. James Justin, Vestergaard, Wattfass and Christensen will likely be the back four. But then we go to the midfield, it gets a bit tricky. So Winks and Ndidi speak for themselves, but we could see Buenanote drop to the bench despite a decent appearance against Tottenham. And we could see Mavadidi on the left and De Cordova Reed shifting to the centre. So let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below about that. Fatawa was also quite impressive in that match on Monday night. And Jemmy Vardy up front, what more can we say about him? He's a Premier League legend with a title to his name and he has scored so many goals in this competition. As discussed on Monday's Transfer Tips video and podcast, I think Kwanzaa will start in Game Week 2, but I'm not fully convinced and I certainly understand the FPL managers are looking to sell Kwanzaa. His price has gone down to 4.4 million and there's a good chance that Kanate pips him to a starting spot. But I think it'll be Allison in goal, Trent, Kwanzaa, Van Dijk and Robertson with Gravenberg, Shaboslai and McAllister Salah, Jota and Diaz. I think the starting 11 speaks for itself. You could make a case for Harvey Elliott starting, but I honestly think Liverpool will go for the same starting 11 as Gameik 1 and the only possible change is Kanate in for Kwanzaa. But it would seem very harsh because he's a very young talent with a lot of potential and he didn't play that badly in the first half. He lost some duels with the lap and I think Arne Slot made a ruthless decision which ended up paying off. But I think Ipswich Town is a completely different kettle of fish to Brentford and Ivan Tony is very unlikely to start this game or play any minutes as he's on the verge of leaving the club. Now, if Ivan Tony was in the starting 11 for Brentford, I think Kanate would start for Liverpool to win those duels, but it will be a different type of striker in Wissa and I think Kwanzaa can do very well against him profile-wise. So in my opinion, the young centre-back will start alongside Virgil van Dijk and Liverpool's fixtures are fantastic until game week eight.
This might be the most difficult team to predict this week. Manchester City, Pep Guardiola, Ipswich Town at home. I could see several players being rotated. Even at right back, we could see Kyle Walker get his first start of the season. John Stones might get a lot of minutes or even start the match. And Nathan Ake is another option in the back line. Not to mention in the attack, we could see Savinho start again and Phil Foden will be on the bench. And who even knows, we could see a change in the midfield as well with Rodri getting his first start and minutes of the campaign. But I think it'll be Edison in goal, Rico Lewis, Akanji, Ruben Diaz and Gavardio with Bernardo Silva and Kovac as the two holding midfielders if Man City go for this 4-2-3-1 but it could easily be a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-4. Foden, De Bruyne, Doku and Erling Haaland up front. I'm very confident the Norwegian will start and he could be a triple captaincy option this week. The next three fixtures look fantastic for the citizens. I could see them getting maximum points. Then it's Arsenal and Newcastle back to back and afterwards you've got even more good fixtures until game week 11. And my biggest doubts would be Savinho, Ake, Walker and Stones. Any of those players could start, even Rodri. So expect several changes for Man City potentially, but I'm just going for the one in Phil Foden. It might seem harsh to drop Harry Maguire, after his performance in game week one against Fulham in the opening game of the season. But I think we'll see a very similar backline to Ajax a few years ago under Eric Ten Hag with Anana in goal, Mazraoui, De Ligt, Lisandro Martinez and Diego Dalla on the left-hand side. Casemiro and Kobi Mainu. Now there are reports that Ugarte is close to signing for Manchester United and he could replace Casemiro in the starting eleven in a couple of weeks' time. Diallo, Fernandes, Garnacho and Xerxy is a potential front four, but it could be Rashford instead of Xerxy and we have to wait another week for Xerxy's first Premier League start. He scored after coming off the bench against Fulham and that was a great way to make an impact at Man United. The next four fixtures are very tough, but I do like Southampton away in game week four after the international break. And let's keep a big eye on that huge clash against Liverpool at home in game week three. Just like with a few other teams, the biggest out could be at right back as Kieran Trippier is available, but he played no minutes whatsoever in Gimmick 1, whilst Liveramento had a decent performance and got one bonus point in FPL. Nick Pope was the star of the show with maximum bonus points and he will start every single game for Newcastle United. Liveramento, Kraft, Dan Byrne and Lewis Hall will be the back four, whilst Fabian Scher is suspended for three matches and they're in the transfer market looking for a centre-back and Mark Gay is at the top of their list. A midfield free of Bruno Guimaraes, Longstaff and Jolington is very likely and Jolington scored the winner against Southampton. He's such a crucial player for the tomb and the front three will be Jacob Murphy, Anthony Gordon and Isak. The next four fixtures look good on paper, even Tottenham at home in game week three. Newcastle have scored 10 goals in the last two home matches against that opposition and I think Newcastle can still tick along nicely in the long term. Milenkovic, the new signing for Nottingham Forest, was suspended for game week one for a red card he got with Fiorentina last season, but no one knew about it, which was the biggest surprise of them all. I think he'll be available for game week two now, but there was no clear-cut answer in terms of how many games he's suspended for. I think it's implied that it's only one match, as it said game instead of games, but Sells will be in goal, a back four of Williams, Milenkovic, Murillo, and also Toffolo, as Aina could be injured for game week two. He picked up a knock around 50 minutes and was subbed off very early against Bournemouth. Also Sangare and Yates is the likely midfield partnership with Danilo picking up a long-term injury. He will likely be out for the rest of the year. It looked like a bad one, but thankfully it wasn't the worst case scenario as it could have been even longer than that. The front four speaks for itself. Elanga, Gibbs White, hudson Adoy, and Chris Wood, but Eddie and Ketia is heavily linked with a move to Nottingham Forest and they really want a new striker. So Chris Wood might not be safe in the long term, but he should start against Southampton away in game week two. I may end up jinxing it, but I think Southampton are one of the easier teams to predict and let's see how spectacularly that fails now. But I got it spot on in game week one with McCarthy in goal, Harwood, Bellis, Stevens and Bednarek and the two wingbacks being Sagawara and Walker-Peters and a midfield three of Smallbone, Downs and Aribo with Brereton Diaz and Armstrong up front. The next four fixtures look very good actually, so if you are in the market for a 4 million defender like Harwood Bellis and you could still go for Stevens or Bednarik as well, they are decent options to replace Valentin Barco for example if you want to go for that sort of player and there could be a clean sheet 
in that time frame. So let's see how things pan out. I wouldn't recommend going for Formula Defenders in general, and there are bigger priorities in your 15-man squad. Even rolling could be the best play, despite Badakor potentially dropping to 3.9 million before his eventual move to Sevilla on loan. But I still think Southampton should go for this starting 11. I don't see many changes whatsoever, but football is full of surprises, and they might need one or two tweaks to perfect their system. Rodrigo Bentancur will be unavailable against Everton at home this weekend, and I think Archie Gray is the most likely replacement. Basuma is still suspended by the club for a disciplinary action. So Vicario in goal, Pedro Borro, Romero, Van der Ven, and Adogi, with Archie Gray and Saar as the two holding midfielders. And I think Kulizewski comes into the starting 11. He had a great preseason, and it surprised me to see him on the bench. And I personally think Brennan Johnson will now drop out of the starting 11 with Kulizewski, Madison, Son, and Solanke up front. That's a very strong front four. I could see them scoring a few goals against Everton. Then it's Newcastle and Arsenal, and they struggle in those fixtures last season. Brentford at home afterwards looks decent and Spurs' long-term fixtures are fairly okay, I'd say. But overall with Tottenham, I don't recommend the defensive assets with the exception of Pedro Borro for the attacking potential. He showed it in abundance with that goal against Leicester City. And there's a lot to choose from up front, but Solanke probably offers the best value at 7.5 million. I've gone for several changes in the West Ham starting 11. Ariola will be in goal once again, but I've gone for Sufal at the moment, Todibo, the new signing on loan, and also Max Kilman alongside Emerson Palmieri as the back four. Guido Rodriguez, another new signing, partnering Thomas Salchek with Ward Prowse on the bench. Lucas Paqueta, Kudus, Bowen are fairly locked in, but I've gone for Fulkrug instead of Mikel Antonio against Crystal Palace away. That'll be a very tough game. Both London clubs lost their opening match in Gemic 1. Then it's Man City at home for West Ham just before the international break. Fulham away and Chelsea home also doesn't look particularly appealing, but I do like their attackers. Curtis and Bowen are the best FPL assets the Hammers have to offer. And over time, Aaron Basaka will be the starting right back for West Ham. The 20th and final team is Wolves. Mateus Cunha was on the bench, which was quite surprising. It looked like he would miss the game against Arsenal altogether, but he made a cameo and we could see him playing as a second striker or attacking midfielder just behind the new signing, Strand Larsen, who looked like a handful against the Gunners. He had one great chance, which was only denied by a spectacular David Raya save. Jose Sarr in goal is locked in for now, unless he leaves the club. Then we could see Bentley, a 4 million option in goal, get consistent starts for Wolves, but I don't think that'll happen. Doughty, Mosquera, Totti and Aitnuri should be the back four, but Aitnuri did pick up a knock against Arsenal. And Mosquera is probably the most nailed on 4 million defender you'll see. He's definitely one to look at when Wolves' fixtures get better. The midfield pivot of Joao Gomez and Lamina is actually very solid and would be right up there amongst Premier League clubs. Huang Hee Chan, Cunha, Rodrigo Gomez and Strand Larsen is the likely front four, but don't underestimate Sarabia, for example, who is a quality player on his day. He could even start on the right-hand side with Huang Hee Chan being shifted to the left and Rodrigo Gomez dropping down to the bench. Now, Wolves can also play a back three in certain games, especially against the best clubs, and we could see Rodrigo Gomez operating as a wing-back, but his best position is as a left winger, and I think this starting eleven looks particularly strong against Chelsea at home. That wraps up the lineups for all 20 Premier League clubs. They are predictions. There might be some inaccuracies and things change all the time. There might be an update in the press conference over the next day or so, which will maybe make some picks redundant, for example. So just bear all of that in mind. And these are specifically for Gaming 2. Over the course of the season, we'll see even further changes to the best 11s of all 20 Premier League clubs. Thank you very much for watching this video and listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it, or found it useful, then be sure to smash the like button and subscribe for new. Our aim is to get this to the 200 likes and to keep on pushing towards new goals like 35 subscribers. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram, DylanRCM, and check all the other links in the description below for my Patreon and the championships for early access to my videos, amongst many other perks. The Discord server, FPL League, Draft Town, and also Spotify. Leave a five-star review on my podcast. It goes a long way to supporting my channel. I wish you all the best of luck for Game Week 2 and the rest of the season, and I'll see you next time.